our Monday night lecture tonight is Mr. James Bassett, landscape architect from Lima, Ohio, who is the principal of the James Bassett and Associates landscape architecture firm in Lima. We've had the good fortune of having the firm of James Bassett and Associates under contract with us for the spring term. Uh, teaching in the third year uh, design studio. Uh, Mr. Al Edmondson uh, in the partial back there has been uh, working with the third uh, year students and he and his wife and Mrs. Bassett are with us tonight. Uh, also as a guest tonight uh, I'd like to recognize Dr. Joe Trimmer from the English department who is a recipient for next year's Lilly Foundation grant. Uh, Joe, would you stand up please? And we're really delighted to have uh, uh, Joe here with us and the recipient of the grant which will be working with the Landscape Architecture Department and uh, uh, other faculty in the college uh, for a year's uh, bit of research. Uh, for some of you who knew Ken Helfand when he taught here, uh, Joe is also going to be working with him. Mr. Bassett is a graduate of the Ohio State University in landscape architecture. He has been in practice in, uh, with firms in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, has been in private practice since 1954. He's been a recipient of the ASLA Design Awards, a first award from the American Academy in Rome Design Competition, a member of the American Society of Landscape Architects, he is on the State Board of Examiners in Ohio for Landscape Architecture Registration, and is himself registered in Ohio and Michigan. So I'm very happy to introduce Mr. James Bassett, who will be uh, talking about reflections on his private practice. Mr. James Bassett. Thank you, John. <clears throat> well, it is a pleasure to be here tonight and uh, on a nice warm spring evening when I'm sure that many of you would rather be enjoying the weather than uh, perhaps in an auditorium like this. But um, what I'd like to um, talk about tonight is um, some reflections on the opportunities in landscape architecture. And um, I think that uh, uh, is certainly a subject which perhaps varies from region to region and I'll try to give you my own uh, perhaps unique or particular impressions of what I think the opportunities are in this particular region. The subject of landscape architecture or the field of landscape architecture has changed an awful lot in, in 20 to 25 years since I got my education and since I've been practicing here. And I think that uh, uh, it's a little hard to realize when you come into the field at this point uh, the kind of evolution that the, uh, the field has gone through in such a short span of years. Many of you may have your roots in this particular part of the country, or you may have your roots in, in um, other regions, such as the East Coast or the West Coast. And, um, and perhaps the image of our field is, is a little more definitive in those extremes of our country. The, the land and the population concentrations are certainly different than they are in this part of the country. And so one expects to see more evidence of our work in those areas. And uh, perhaps the landscape itself is, is uh, 
more dynamic than you find in, in this part of the country. So what I'll try to do uh, tonight is to show you some of the history, first of all, of the things that have evolved in our own office, uh, perhaps a, a, a very short introduction of a number of projects that have uh, been produced in, in uh, over a period of 15 or 20 years. And I'd like to then uh, maybe go into a, a section of illustrations which show perhaps some uh, bit of alarming uh, evidence that we have on the horizon and maybe see if we can also project ourselves a little bit into the future into some areas of concern in our own particular um, time and our own particular area here in Indiana and Ohio. So without further ado, I'll have the lights and get started. <clears throat> Here are a couple of photographs. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about our, our own office and its location. Lima is uh, a couple hours away to the north and east of here. And um, I might say that driving down here was not the most scenic experience. When I got, came to this, the uh, state line, I think the uh, sign said, uh, Hoosier hospitality is no accident. And uh, I didn't know exactly what that meant, but some of the scenery that I saw between here and there looked like it was an accident, or it had experienced an accident. And uh, perhaps my, uh, my location and, uh, and some of my experiences have also been accidents. But, um, I really didn't have any, uh, any far-reaching plans when I located in Lima. That was my home, and I went back there and began practicing uh, the sort of garden landscaping that uh, uh, many people expected in those days, and found that uh, with the dynamic growth of, of, uh, of many things that were happening in our own region, that there was plenty of opportunity for people who had some knowledge of landscape architecture. And at that time, in 1954, 55, really that the term landscape architecture was sort of unheard of in our particular neighborhood. Our uh, office is, uh, is located on the banks of a, of a river. Uh, it really is kind of a muddy little stream at times, but um, Nevertheless, we're on the only hill in Allen County, which is 25 feet high. And uh, our office is located there. We have 10 people. And uh, one of those is a secretary, sort of office manager type. And we have, uh, I think, four, la five registered landscape architects and some technical people who have been trained in, in uh, engineering and drafting. And then we have one unique person who has just switched from being a Catholic priest to a planner. So I'll tell you more about that later. This uh, kind of a setting you, you may suspect is uh, more conducive to sort of relaxation than it may be to hard work. But um, let me tell you that, that when the pressure is on, there's a lot of hard work done. And we go about balancing the budget at the end of the year like any other business, and we're in business to make a profit. And uh, yet, on the other hand, I think it's important to say that if anyone goes after that profit with the idea of, uh, of doing shoddy work, they're, they're pretty soon straightened out, either by myself or someone else in the office who has some pretty high standards, or the client. And so 
the response to the client, I think, is ultimately very important, whether it's a municipality or a, uh, an individual property owner. Um, that's one of the most stimulating aspects of, of, I think, the design business, is to respond to the needs of a client. Now, one thing that happens in having, say, 20 years under your belt is that you are able to go back and look at things that you did uh, 20 years ago. And uh, I've often observed that uh, the size of the circles that the people uh, draw on the plans for trees are sort of proportional to the number of years they've been in business. So if the uh, uh, trees look a little bit thick, well, after 20 years, uh, you realize what the ultimate scale of plant materials are and what the, what the uh, eventual effect of it really is. Well, we were fortunate enough, fortunate enough to move out of the realm of, of uh, residential design into the field of campus planning. And during the late 50s and 60s, we worked on, I suppose, a dozen or 15 different campuses in Ohio and other localities. And um, the first one of these projects was a little campus called Bluffton College, uh, maybe 15 or 20 acres of uh, original campus that had uh, a number of buildings of uh, vintage that went back to the turn of the century, but it had some very beautiful landscape, a very natural kind of landscape. You see on the left the master plan that was developed over a period of years, and on the right some of those floodplain open space areas that were well defined with vegetation that existed on the campus. It was interesting that, um, that it had a very natural, woodsy look to it. And, uh, and yet, uh, uh, it was crisscrossed with drives and parking areas and, and was really uh, sort of a conglomeration of, of building and drives and walkways. And yet, uh, the, the existing buildings in this planning process were enhanced by the removal of many of the old drives that were no longer were serviceable and put into a setting that was quiet and, and uh, in keeping with that sort of nice natural area. But it wasn't very long until we discovered that, uh, that the expansion plans were to include buildings that would be tearing out the edges of the open space where you have the wooded areas as you, as you see them on the right and replacing that with buildings. So actually the strategy was a very simple one of trying to acquire enough land and provide building spaces and parking spaces and recreation spaces in such a way that, that uh, they were placed in areas that were of less importance in terms to in terms of the natural environment. And then there were simple design problems such as footbridges and walkways and lighting problems that were solved over a period of time. Well, that, uh, that was a very s small, simple scale of, of a project that probably is similar to, to what you might expect a landscape architect to be involved with. Uh, on a little larger basis, we were involved with uh, uh, Bowling Green University over a period of 20 years where, where master plans were developed a, a, at two different intervals to project an enlarged student enrollment. Well, what happened, as you see on the right here, that many of the areas that were once vehicular-oriented streets and uh, uh, spaces that then became the focus for new building, were converted to green space 
and quiet areas. Uh, in, in some cases, uh, parking lots and, and streets were removed for, for uh, better entry treatments, and the, the cars really removed to parking areas that were screened by berms and landscaping. And uh, so we had here pretty much a matter of, of um, design which was involved with corrective measures that uh, uh, helped to clean up the, the old parts of the campus. And yet at the same time, there were a number of uh, areas that that went well beyond that into the open flatlands of, uh, of northern Ohio and incorporated uh, whole new landscape uh, settings for buildings and, and artwork. <clears throat> well, as you know, that during this period, there was a, a great deal more sophistication developed in the planning process for institutions and, and individual sites, the scale of a college campus, the scale of, uh, say, a, uh, a park, a large park area, and eventually even on a regional basis. But um, I guess our, our concern for a better process in planning sort of paralleled the, the general uh, uh, trends of the profession. And this is um, a study that we did for Mary Holmes College, which was a small uh, junior college at West Point, Mississippi. And uh, this received uh, one of the, well, I guess, uh, awards about the early 70s uh, that was given by the ASLA. And I think the reason for it was that it, it did show a fairly sensitive kind of analysis of, of the site problem and then the application and the, the creative synthesis process of, of providing a plan that seemed to fit the site in a, in a sensitive way. And perhaps, too, uh, it, it uh, incorporated a, a kind of institution that didn't have generous resources like most of the state universities. The amount of money that is, was spent on this uh, campus was really very meager, and yet uh, the planning was done in a, in a rather sensitive way. You see on the left really sort of a, a summary of some of the site features. The buildings that existed were just a few small buildings in the lower left lower right-hand corner of the site. And then there was 160 acres of unused land to the north and to the, uh, to the west. And it had its own particular features. And the problem really was how to expand into that area in, a, in the proper way. Uh, Really, the, the analysis of topography and, uh, and soils and vegetation uh, were not done in great depth, but I think it helped to recognize the obvious, uh, obvious patterns that ought to be incorporated into the new development plan. And uh, some dimensions in terms of, of what those campus uh, extensions ought to be, be uh, restricted to. And really, it amounted to then of coming up with a couple of alternative concepts, which uh, were, were very broad stroke, and then uh, uh, developed into, into more detailed kinds of vehicular circulation diagrams and illustrations that would indicate the massing of buildings and how they fit into that natural topography and uh, the final 
visualization of the new landscape that was, was incorporated with that complex of roads and, and buildings and, and educational facilities. We also got involved with uh, a number of other kinds of, of larger projects uh, of all the size of two to 300 acres. This was a golf course that is located very near our own office. And uh, in, many, in many of these projects, we had had really not much prior experience. So the kind of research and investigation that was necessary uh, in some cases was quite extensive. Al Edmondson, who is here tonight, is the, is the um, uh, designer of this project. Al was with the city of Akron for a number of years before he came to our office, and I think did a very nice job of putting this project together in such a way that uh, it has worn well with, uh, with its use. And, um, I don't know whether Al would want to say anything about this project or not. Uh, it, its hallmark are the sticker bushes and the railroad ties. <laughs> but um, I think that the, uh, the combination of, uh, of spatial designed play elements along with, with some standard elements of uh, play equipment are very nicely combined and uh, again um, uh, I think this has received at least a couple of different awards and perhaps uh, seriously the one of the important uh, uh, attributes of the plan is the fact that it that such a small park that is located on say uh, a standard size city lot has so much greenery built into it to create such a pleasant setting and that it does stand the wear and tear quite well and provides an unusual uh, amount of variety in terms of uh, play experiences for the children of the neighborhood. I guess it's important to realize that while we're busy creating what we think are good products in landscape architecture, buildings such as this, commercial buildings with their own beautiful settings of landscaping, that there, there are other people busy at work. And I think for for every, every one of the, of the good products that we put out, there's, a, there's a, another half a dozen jobs that are just happening. This is a, the, the bank job on the left is a little drive up banking facility, which we disguised in a landscape plaza and the the um, vehicular lanes approaching the banking facilities are channeled through this little grove of trees and across the brick pavements. And, and uh, I think tend to disguise the fact that it's, that it's truly a, a suburban kind of entity in a downtown. But um, the point I think that, that we have to be aware of is that that uh, so much is occurring while we're trying to produce a, a few good things that, uh, that maybe we're only making a little, uh, or we're only contributing one little drop in a big bucket of water. The, the housing on the left, again, is, is uh, one of our jobs where we, spent a great deal of time developing open spaces and unified green spaces. And contrasted to that on the right is the, 
is the usual subdivision that is growing by leaps and bounds. And it doesn't seem to make much difference how much we want to create higher densities and, and uh, better living environments. The tendencies toward the sprawl and the individual uh, homeowner oriented residence that consumes lots of land seems to be moving on and, and at a rapid pace. In fact, in our particular region, since the, the uh, since the um, uh, loosening up of, of um, sewage treatment requirements, there's even more sprawl than, than uh, there was just a few years ago. Another area that, that we've been working in is the, is the area of the development of stormwater retention facilities for basically site, individual site projects, not community-wide projects, but for institutions that uh, perhaps have uh, 50 acres of land and have a drainage problem. And this example of the, of the one on the left here is, is a small campus in Marion, Ohio, that uh, was almost tabletop in character, a cornfield. And uh, the design of the, of the site was really designed around the problem of stormwater retention so that they could provide adequate drainage outlet for their own stormwater. And this ends up being a comprehensive kind of problem for the landscape architect because the building elevations, the levels of parking lots, the walkways, the actual definition of a flood area within the site has to all be worked out in the, in the process of designing the site. And uh, yet, in, in that sense, it's a rather comprehensive kind of site problem. But then if you look at the slide on the right, you'll see at the same time we're doing this, that in the community, um, we're still solving problems on a one-shot basis. That here, our beautiful Ottawa River that goes through our city is now receiving a 48-inch interceptor sewer. And... Um, there is no attention given to, to you know, the, the complete project of what you would do to that river to uh, really make it a beautiful part of the community. And uh, in that, the, 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 the real problem there isn't the sewer or the river, it's just the fact that no one gives attention to the to the landscape elements that were attended to in the project on the left. You know, what kind of slopes and vegetation do you put on the borders of the waterway? Um, what kind of relative elevation is given to the buildings and the, and the, uh, the community along the edges of the waterway? And I think the, the problem on the right needs to have a comprehensive solution and not you know, a single solution of, of providing only an interceptor sewer because the process of bringing the equipment in and solving some of the, the important uh, sewer problems could have been used to correct and to, and to solve the landscape problem with only a, a, a little bit more money spent. And I think that this is a lesson that, that we really need to take seriously, that the money spent in the project on the left was all done within the normal budgets given to those buildings as the university or the institution provided those first and second buildings on a brand new site. And uh, I think that, that uh, what it means as the landscape architect approaches the problem in, in um, 
the development of plans for sites of this nature that you have to stretch your imagination a little bit because no one else has any. And unless you come up with some kind of a creative solution, no one else will think of it. And in, in my estimation, that is the, uh, the crying need of almost every project that we undertake, that, that uh, people are used to dwelling on the building and, and uh, its interior furnishings, but they're not used to, to looking at the complete site and solving some of the, the aesthetic problems uh, very well, but they don't even solve the functional problems in most cases. <clears throat> well, some of the some of the problems that I'm I'm talking about really go much deeper, and uh, and are much more difficult to solve on a community-wide basis. That the highway system that we've we, we, are, we have experienced in the last 10 years has developed a whole new strategy in terms of land use and development. And uh, most of this is done without very much thought toward quality and amenity. And I believe that, that uh, there are enough good examples in landscape architecture today that people are becoming less and less satisfied with this kind of solution. That their level of ex expectation has risen so dramatically in the last 20 years that um, all we have to do is create a better solution than that and people will buy it. They'll purchase it. Just like they will purchase anything that has a, a well, that, that has a financial plan for it, or a financing plan, and has some quality to it. I think that, that many of the things we're producing right now will end up in that junk heap on the right, and yet there will be a number of things that occur that are better and better, just like this regional shopping center that have amenities built into them, that have long-lasting values. And I think that in almost every case where the, the long-lasting qualities and, uh, are evident that there has been a landscape architect involved, whether it's indoors or outdoors. Now, um, <clears throat> I think there are two areas that I would like to talk about in terms of a future, the future of landscape architecture, and these are my own particular uh, interests. One of them is in the area of really suburban development. You know, what's happening on the fringes of, of our urban America? The new development, the new residential, the new commercial. And the other is the counterpart the regeneration of the urban core. And it seems to me that, that there are some ways in which we can control the strip development that you saw in some of the previous slides, ways in which we can, can uh, read the landscape and be a lot more sensitive to its development than um, than we have in the past. This is a planned unit development called Muirfield Village near Columbus, Ohio. It's about 1,600 acres. And in this village, <clears throat> there was an intent to provide an open space system for bikeways, for walkways, a place for recreation, swimming pools. Uh, it's really centered around uh, golf, there are two 18-hole golf courses in the plans. One of them is in, in existing now, which is uh, a tournament course that was designed by Jack Nicholas. The other is just um, uh, 
in the planning stages now and uh, will soon be started this summer. Also in, the, in this open space system though, there, there's a recognition of, of some of the natural environment, ravines with, with uh, maple and oak and beech and the underlying ground covers of wildflowers, the natural courses for, for the watershed. And as many of you know, once you start the urbanization process, that when you start emptying a sewer out into this little ravine, then you start eroding uh, much of the existing landscape, or in many cases, just the process of building sewers, houses, tends to destroy this kind of landscape on the left. Well, in that same open space system, we have also stormwater retention basins which collect that water and meter, meters that water out slowly into the existing ravine so that we tend to stabilize the stormwater runoff. In many cases, we went to great expense to route sanitary sewers and water lines around areas that were designated as natural open space so that they would not be um, tampered with. In this process, though, of, of uh, identifying some of the, the goals, we felt that it was important that the framework, the street system, take on a character that, that would ensure that the strip development didn't occur. And, uh, and so we designed a framework of limited access throughways, parkways, so to speak, that are similar in character to the example on the upper right. And the main spine, as you can see on the, uh, on the slide on the left, is a boulevard. And then the collector streets that, that operate off of that also are limited access so that the only real access to the street system is off of a series of small courts cul-de-sacs and uh, neighborhood streets. The, the study of these streets really were sort of starting with a pattern, uh, an idea, as you can see on the right, where you really didn't have the evidence of an urban view at all. But then in the details that you see in the, in the left, even when you got down into the court streets themselves, there were dimensions and, and uh, green spaces that were identified as real honest to goodness open space for the planting of trees and buffers. And uh, you can see even that the tree lawns and the, the scale of the open spaces at the ends of loops and cul-de-sacs were given individual character in terms of topography and the width of the of those open spaces. The slide on the, on the right then shows you the, the dimension of one of those particular courts where really have a, a system of, of uh, cluster development of both residential and commercial character and that one side of the, of the house faces the, the street side, the other side faces the open space. And really the foundation for this then was a series of inventories that looked at the total site. And um, the, the slopes, the, the stormwater um, watersheds were identified and um, incorporated then into that open space system. The soils um, are identified and we came up with some systems of classification. Uh, the plant life inventory was also done in a rather sophisticated way. And um, I think that, that uh, my impression of these uh, inventories are that they're, they're really quite useful 
And I'm not sure that in every case that you'd want to go into the detail that we went into here because some of the things that, that they tell you are the obvious things that you don't, you know, you don't build a house in a floodplain or you don't build a house in a place where the soils won't support it and uh, some obvious things that almost any farm boy would know or the obvious things that any naturalist might uh, pick up in the, in, by moving across the site and identifying the the categories of landscape that have the greatest value. But just the process of mapping these things helps a great deal in terms of keeping your perspective over a long period of time. This project has been in our office for, I suppose, five to six years. And, uh, and it's been in the total planning process, I suppose, for more than 10 years. And so no matter how well you have these things in mind, you almost have to have the maps staring you in the face as you make day-to-day -day decisions, and, and sometimes even then you forget. The master plan, I think, is, is um, significant in that it does embody a framework of open space and the infrastructure of streets and sewers, which will service a number of units of development that are flexible enough in, their, in the density of their development and the size of their total dimension that the developer then can come in and develop this land over a period of years and be assured that, that there is a reasonable kind of setting for for this total community. You can see in the detail on the right, you know, the, the evolution of, of the second golf course in terms of its outline. And um, there, there's a lot of economics involved in that plan in terms of the measurements of, of the total land area devoted to open space and and golf course, the, the economics of the frontage that faces on the golf course. And I think important, another important aspect is the, um, the stormwater system itself. And you can see how those blue areas indicate the storage basins for the stormwater. Those various modules of, uh, of development are illustrated here. A single family cl cluster, uh, a higher density type of, of cluster, which is almost what you would uh, expect in a zero lot line. It's really a patio type home on a very small lot. And I think that, that the, the kind of townhouse that you see in this illustration can also fit into that same kind of planned unit development. This is another project, though, but I, I think it really shows the importance of good landscaping and amenities in terms of taking very simple housing units, two-story townhouses, giving them individual entrances and door yards, individual colors, and yet having them knit together with a, a continuous kind of landscape environment that ties it all together effectively. Now, the thing that you may not notice here is the absence of automobiles, and those automobiles are, are hidden behind the brick wall over on the far right in courts that are are framed by the buildings and by the screen walls at the ends of each court. So that the interconnecting green space in this project is much the same as it is in, in the larger Muirfield project where, where the importance of this green space is enhanced a great deal by its continuity and its um, extension through a, a 
very broad area so that people can walk from their, their home to the swimming pool or to the play area without crossing streets and uh, intersecting traffic. <coughs> well, this kind of work that you see in Muirfield, I think, has its own level of economy that you can go through each, each one of the elements that I've talked about in that, in that development and study the economics of it. And I think that you'll find that it's, it's a, a skillful use of land, an economical use of land, an economical use of, of development, uh, such as streets, sewers, so that uh, you can defend the plan on that basis. And certainly, it's appealing, it's saleable. Uh, we, we thought it was interesting that golf course frontage lots were very expensive. You know, they, they sold from 35,000 to 50,000. But we also found that some of the lots that faced natural open areas sold for the same price. And so I think it proved that, that people were oriented toward amenities, whether it was golf course or lake or natural areas. And yet, uh, I'm not sure that we can afford this too much longer. <laughs> they, cost of, of doing all of the things that I've mentioned are going up. And I really think that we have to begin to look at the alternatives. And part of the alternatives are in the regeneration of, of central areas in our cities. And uh, I think a lot of that has to do with the cost of energy, the cost of, of the processes that we go through for the basic developments that we're doing today. And the old pattern that you see on the left here of, of tearing down buildings and clearing land for redevelopment, I think is almost obsolete also. We have, you know, on the one hand, lots of space. It, it seems like it's almost limitless when we travel across the Great Plains. And yet in, in many areas, we're consuming land that is really critical in terms of its soil type and its value to agriculture. And yet, uh, uh, as we as we study these things, I think our our tendency is to want to get up and leave when we see these buildings that we see on the right. I I've studied this uh, situation. This is our downtown Lima, and um, I don't find too many people enthused about those buildings. Talk about historic preservation, and 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 yet people find it very difficult to visualize uh, uh, what can be done in that situation. I think that's Al. He's trying to figure it out over here on the left. Well, we suggested that um, that. In, in one of our studies that we start tearing off some of the old tin fronts of buildings in our central business district and we came up with some visualizations of, of landscaping, paving, lighting, graphics, and shop front restoration. And uh, much to our surprise, we found a guy that took this report seriously and asked us to see what he could find behind that old walker shoes front. And um, so we got him to tear it off. And uh, that was the end result of the painting, the cleanup, and the, the 
restoration of, of signs and, and awnings and so forth. We, had, we found that, uh, that when they put that metal front on that they had chipped all of the stone sills off and, and the stone headers over the uh, windows. And uh, so this is kind of, I guess, restoration or historic uh, uh, something or other. Maybe someone will have a name for it someday. It probably won't be good, but it's, it's an interesting economic phenomenon that, that uh, structures, houses, buildings in, in some of our central cities can be bought for $5 a square foot, $6 a square foot. And if we had to go out and build them in Muirfield, they'd cost 50 or or $100 a square foot. And we've put a value on this kind of facelift process. And um, what you see there would cost maybe $6 a square foot. You know, we put that much on the outside of the building and out front of it. Well, that only puts it up to $12 a square foot, so that still leaves quite a lot for the interior renovation of the building. And we've studied this process to the point that we've, we're now looking at residential neighborhoods where houses can be bought for $1,500. They're really neat places. No windows. Uh, they haven't been painted for 20 years. And, and yet, in Lima, we have a rehab program now that is buying old houses that are almost to the point where they should be demolished, sorting out those that can be put back onto the market at a price range of about $15,000. Uh, and I think this is, this is a, a, a great discovery. And, um, and one important element of this process, though, is the cleanup of the general neighborhood and environment. You can paint all you want to, but unless someone gets busy and fix up the curb, fixes up the curbs and the sidewalks and the lighting, and provides open space and corrects a lot of things that, that were mistakes in the very beginning, it won't do much good to paint and fix up the front of the building. And so landscaping and the identification of amenities in these communities is, and how you introduce amenity is, is terribly important. Here's an example of just you know, getting rid of signs, developing new sidewalks and lighting and, and street furnishings in a, a project that we did in Bell Fountain. Uh, the, the change that occurs. And we found that by doing the landscaping that uh, in, in many cases the shop front uh, cleanup campaign works itself out with a few guidelines and, and some prodding occasionally. But a, an important element in those, in those streetscape or environmental cleanup projects is that they're broad enough that, um, that it really creates a new identity for the community and the neighborhood. This is another project, which was uh, one that we did uh, all five or six years ago in Youngstown, Ohio. And this is, shows you two plans for uh, the mall that was built there. The one on the left, the circulation concept, which, which opened up the way to setting Federal Street and the public square aside for pedestrian use. And then you can see on the right-hand side the illustrative landscape plan that was done for that project. This was illustrated in, in uh, considerable detail in terms of sketches and visualizations for street furnishings, lighting, um, 
the the character of the lighting in terms of of its scale and its color quality was uh, carefully worked out in contrast to the into the more functional kind of lighting that occurred on the surrounding streets and this is really very important in, in this kind of a project, in a regeneration project, because unless you create the sense of almost a complete change of the environment, no one's going to believe you. If you plant little trees up and down the street and don't give attention to the lighting, then you only have the job perhaps half done. Um, and in this way, if you, you create such a, a, a change that um, uh, everyone, everyone realizes it, and, and, and most of all, the property owners realize it, that it's happened. Uh, the visualization of this is terribly important, because in each of the cases that we've worked, you have a selling job to property owners in terms of how it's going to be financed and uh, when you tell them it's going to cost them fifty thousand dollars as a property owner adjacent to one of these projects they 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 almost fall off their chair and uh, and yet you have to have the the sales tools put together to help other people visualize what, what it's going to look like in the, in the, as a final product. Well, this project on the, on the left is one which we, um, which I wanted to talk a little bit about in detail. It's called the, the Kibbe Corners Project in Lima. And, um, this is a residential neighborhood with a commercial main street. And we went through the process of developing a, uh, what was called a streetscape plan for those two main streets. And it wasn't a very lavish plan, but this is a neighborhood which uh, uh, is, is almost to the point of, of uh, slum conditions in some areas. And, um, there's some 750 families that live in this neighborhood, and out of those 750 housing units, there are probably 50 of them that are, are near the point of dilapidation. And um, the real impetus of this project was the fact that along Main Street was going to be built a new senior citizens high-rise building which would house uh, some 200 families of elderly. And um, the people of the neighborhood were concerned enough that they formulated a, a neighborhood group that uh, then sponsored the project and actually went out and got petitions signed by the people up and down the streets to say that they would except the cost of the financing of new sidewalks and street trees. And um, then a number of other projects were identified in terms of things that would upgrade the neighborhood, including neighborhood parks and better off-street parking for the uh, Main Street commercial, as well as a number of, of studies that were done of shop fronts that uh, would be done privately shop front renovation that would be done privately. And actually, I, I thought when the people came to my office that, I, that this kind of project would never work. Where you would go out and try to sell people in a slum neighborhood the idea that they ought to finance their own sidewalks and street lighting and street trees. And, uh,